Today, I'm joining you from Perth, Western Australia, on the traditional lands of the Noongar people. We all pay our respects to the first Australians on whose land we each meet and acknowledge and celebrate their elders past and present. I welcome you to the last of the ANU Crawford Leadership Big Picture Series panel discussion. Throughout the month of June, we have held five panel discussions on a range of topics, some of the most important challenges facing us in these unprecedented times. All our discussions are available on YouTube and ANU TV. Today we have an outstanding lineup of panellists who will look back over the past discussions, give us their thoughts on some of the big issues of the day and challenge us with their perspectives on matters such as globalisation, nationalism, the increasing rivalry between great powers, the fracture between the East and the West, growing inequality and injustice, the disruption of technology, and how our climate and our global economy will cope in a post-COVID world. The panel discussion is not live, but we have taken questions from registration and given them to the panellists. So please join with me in hearing from the Honourable Kevin Rudd, Ambassador Samantha Power and Dr Lynn Cook, hosted by Janice Peterson from SBS World News. Like Julie, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I am today. It happens, it happens to be a beautiful patch of Sydney the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I extend my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Hello, everyone. I'm Janice Peterson from SBS World News, and it's my great pleasure to be hosting this ANU Crawford Leadership Panel, Big Picture Panel, What Kind of World? Again, a big hello to everyone tuning in. It is so wonderful to have you with us and a big uh, thank you to everyone who sent through questions for this panel. We will try to get through as many of those as we can, but there is a bit of a crossover in some areas that we're likely to cover. So hopefully, even if your particular question isn't put to our esteemed panel, we will still cover the territory that you're interested in. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended the world. It's changed our lives in the most profound and unexpected ways, and it's thrown up a lot of questions as well. So what effect will the pandemic have on the deeper forces shaping the world we live in? What will happen to globalisation? What happens to the distribution of power in the international system, and who will lead a post-pandemic world? What's the future of multilateralism? And how will the deep currents of nationalism and populism be affected? What won't change? Well, we'll explore these questions and much more in today's panel. And let me tell you, this is a Zoom chat like I've never had in lockdown. This is an absolute highlight and I'm sure that you're looking forward to it too. Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia and President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, New York. Kevin Rudd became Australia's 26th Prime Minister in 2007. He was also, of course, a foreign minister for Australia. He's very active, as we know, on the international stage, using his vast experience in foreign affairs to help shape policy and foster diplomacy. He's not in New York, but he's in sunny Queensland. Welcome, Kevin Rudd. Good to be with you. Wonderful. Samantha Power, former US ambassador to the UN, professor of practice, Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard Law School. She served as the 28th US permanent representative to the UN, as well as a member of President Barack Obama's cabinet. And he says she is one of our most foremost thinkers on foreign policy. We're absolutely thrilled to have her with us. Welcome, Ambassador Samantha Power. Great to be here. Wonderful. And Lynn, Dr. Lynn Kwok is Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies and Senior Research Fellow at the University of Cambridge. Now, her research focuses on international relations, security and law, particularly in the Asia Pacific. Welcome aboard, Dr. Lynn Kwok. Thanks so much for having me, Janice. Good to be Absolute pleasure. 
Kevin, I'd like to begin with you. For the past 100 years, the world order, of course, has largely been shaped by the US more than any other nation, but it faces a peer competitor in China and relations between the two are increasingly hostile. Now, you've had a lot to say about this. You recently argued that we're heading into a Cold War 1.5 and a steady drift towards international anarchy. Why do you see this as a like thing that other countries can do to prevent it? Well, we need to think clearly about what constitutes a global order. Um, I think what history teaches us is it's made up of a couple of things. Uh, the first is, um, whether we like it or not, a balance of power uh, or a predisposition for power to lie with a great power. And since effectively 1945, that's been the United States. But the second element of the global order is let's call it the international system. And that's made up of the institutions of global governance, either through the UN, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, and those which have been developed since then, such as the G20. Um, and an order, whether it's functioning or not, is usually the product of those two things working with a reasonable degree of harmony. Of course, what's changed, and uh, you correctly pointed this out, is the rise of China. This has been a 40 year long project, but it's really become much sharper since the advent of Xi Jinping in 2012, 2013. And China now, both through its operational behavior, both in diplomacy and in security policy, is seeking to push America's hold on the balance of power and on the international system back. Uh, China will be, uh, as it were, uh, cautious about saying that in clarion, clear declaratory terms. But if we look at their operational behavior, and Samantha would know this full well from her work on the UN Security Council, uh, that's what we see. And so why do I say that this is uh, pushing us in the direction of international anarchy coming out of the COVID uh, world, the post-COVID reality? I think America emerges from the COVID-19 crisis deeply damaged, both uh, objectively in terms of the hit on the economy uh, objectively on the hit of the United States budget as a result of that, uh, but also reputationally through the extraordinary behavior of Trump and the international community. But the other thing is that people often assume there's a consequence of that China emerges as the winner. I don't subscribe to that view. China has been hit fundamentally by this crisis as well. And that's before we go into the events of the last several days with the possible second wave effect in Beijing. The economy has been hit. It's the worst growth in half a century. Um, and politics has been roiled domestically. And China reputationally in Asia and around the world has taken a big hit because of its failure to contain this virus in the first period of time. And so what I see and I sense is that across the international system, is we're beginning to emerge with neither the United States nor China uh, leading the international system. Uh, that leaves to one side whether the rest of the nation states in the world would actually support Chinese leadership of the international system, a debate in itself. But therefore, for the rest of us who make up middle powers and small powers around the world, we're faced with two strategic alternatives. Either you sit back, buy the popcorn and watch the international order sort of grind into nothingness, um, or uh, what I've described earlier in a review of the UN system several years ago as death by a thousand cuts, that is just incremental irrelevance as people step around the system. Um, uh, or you have other powers and what I describe as middle powers with a combined diplomatic and political interest in triaging the international system until we have a new level of equilibrium uh, between China and the United States. Final point is, that's why in my view, and it's not a partisan view, it's just an objective international relations view, it's kind of crucial that Biden wins to, uh, as I've described in stuff I've written, I think the next four years will be the last chance saloon for American global leadership. Uh, either America gets its dot, 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 dot together in the next four years, um, or they don't, and we continue the drift towards anarchy. And Biden's likely to have a first-class team around him. Uh, but if he loses, um, then I think all bets are off as to what happens to the international order. Samantha, I'd like to bring you in at this point. We've heard um, Kevin Rudd's thoughts on the US there and also China not necessarily emerging triumphant out of this crisis. How do you see the pandemic as accelerating um, existing trends in the international order or do you think we'll see some sort of fundamental turning point uh, 
Kevin Rudd's certainly not suggesting this is going to be the, the case, but is there a possibility, even a remote one, that the, there might be a Chinese-led global order out of this pandemic? Um, well, I agree with uh, an awful lot of what uh, uh, Kevin Rudd has just said, and particularly on the need in the vacuum for middle powers to step up. I think over the course of the last three and a half years, our European friends, our Australian friends, Japan, Republic of Korea, our friends uh, across Latin America and Africa, just shell-shocked really by the 180 in uh, American foreign policy, at least as it was perceived outside. Um, and really only recently have you started to see uh, different actors in different settings beginning to exercise muscles that they actually had all along, uh, but that given the catalytic role that the U.S. had played in mobilizing international coalitions, those muscles hadn't been used for a long time. So I did think it was noteworthy that Australia led the push, yes, with the U.S. prodding it, I'm sure, from behind the scenes, but uh, to look into accountability over the pandemic in terms of how it started, what the lessons learned were. Australia prepared to do that despite the threats and then ultimately the penalties that China has exacted in response to that. Uh, you see on vaccine development, Canada, Germany stepping up, convening countries. Yes, China has very much injected itself into that conversation with a, with a major announcement of a $2 billion contribution, the biggest kind of uh, eye-popping announcement that China has made in an international fora, uh, arguably in history. Um, uh, and, and, but again, who is the convener? Who is the catalytic actor? I think the first movers club is really intriguing uh, from outside, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Taiwan, countries that uh, did better. It doesn't take much to do better than the United States, which is leading the world in COVID deaths, uh, tragically. But for those countries to come together to share best practices on how to combat misinformation, to share uh, lessons learned from reopening schools. But uh, again, the tendency has been over the course of much of the last seven plus decades that it's the US that brings those countries together and creates these fora. So it's kind of intriguing, frankly, to see a countries now just getting on with it. Um, the one thing I would add to what Kevin has, has noted is how important I think, um, given the rise of China and its tremendous influence on the international scene, but given also that the model that it is presenting is an undemocratic model. It is an authoritarian model. It is a capitalist model, yes. Uh, but it, it is a model uh, that democratic countries have a strong interest in outshining. And again, it doesn't help that argument globally uh, that the United States has fared so poorly in its handling of the pandemic. It doesn't help that the U.S. has cut off funding to the World Health Organization at the height of the greatest, largest pandemic since uh, 1918. None of that helps um, in terms of showing what democracies can do, but, but there are democracies right now performing incredibly capably in the face of the pandemic. Democracy showing the importance of expertise, science, uh, state capacity, also state legitimacy, the U.S.'s uh, polarization, the, the divides, the virulence of the divide. I know Australia has, has some of those divides as well, uh, but those divides really impede the kind of collective solidarity you need to see in the face of the pandemic. So as, I, as we think about what the middle powers are doing or how we avoid the kind of anarchy uh, that Kevin has warned about, what those countries that are sitting on the fence or may have been backsliding recently and going in a more populist or xenophobic direction, when they see democracies around the world ably uh, handling, containing at the very least this pandemic, when they watch you know, how countries adjust in the wake of the pandemic in terms of their supply chains, how quickly their economies recover, whether they get the right balance between stimulus uh, and other uh, economic approaches. I mean, all of that is going to have bearing on what is the contest of the 21st century, uh, which is whether the authoritarian capitalist model is going to get more adherence or whether democracies are gonna stand their ground and show that they can deliver for their people.
Samantha, you worked so hard to shape, help shape US foreign policy strategy in recent years. I mean, how do you feel personally when Trump, throughout his presidency, really being so wedded to this idea of, in his words, ending the era of endless wars in faraway lands that many people have never heard of? That's how he puts it. He doesn't want America to be the world's policeman. Uh, I know you've touched on this already, but how do you feel personally that you've worked towards building America up as a global leader and you, you're now seeing this retreat from the current um, administration? Well, first, let me say that um, very few people would raise their hands and say uh, that they're in favor of endless wars. I myself very strongly in opposition to endless wars and acknowledge that there is a fair amount of overlap actually between Vice President Biden, you know, my own, as well as a, as a, you know, democratic foreign policy advocate on the outside, my thinking about the over-militarization of U.S. foreign policy and the rhetoric of President Trump. The, the, but the challenge is President Trump has increased the number of troops in the Middle East and is not at all transparent uh, about his plans, even for Afghanistan, where the uh, massive infusion of not only American uh, blood and treasure, but but that of our closest allies, um, you know, has not brought about the kind of stability uh, that so many people had hoped for. So let me distinguish that, where again, I think there's there's overlap, and the re one reason there's overlap is, of course, that the Afghan war has lasted so long, and the Iraq war carried such costs uh, for the American people, and above all, for the for the people in Iraq and the broader region. Um, and so there's, you know, that, that explains to some extent this uh, desire to kind of come home. Um, but, but other dimensions of, of Trump's foreign policy are rooted, uh, you know, in a, in a fallacy, in, in a notion that we can all set the clock back, not to the pre-Obama period, which he'd also like to do, he'd like to undo anything and everything Obama has done, even if it has delivered for the American people, but to set the clock back to the 18th century, uh, to a time when we didn't have the kind of trade ties, the kind of supply chain uh, networks all around the world, where America was a country, you know, obviously majority white, majority Christian, uh, with none of the diversity that we have and none of the family ties that we have to countries like Nigeria, Bangladesh, India, Somalia, Australia for that matter. And he, there's no setting the clock back. That's, that's an impracticality in his presidency and this pandemic show that. Um, I mean, this is a man who, who would be very quick to want to, to close down borders, but your ability to do that while keeping your economy afloat is very, very is non-existent. So, so I think when you ask, how do I feel? I mean, I feel like, like many, and, and I think the pandemic has really tested uh, the central tenets of Trump's approach. Trump has turned his back on our core alliances. He has rejected international cooperation as something that is in the U.S. interest to the degree that he pursues it. It's very transactional and very short term. He's rejected science and expertise, technical expertise, as being the foundation for public policy, whether uh, in something like a pandemic or uh, on a whole range of, of other issues. And all of those predispositions on Trump's part have come back to haunt not just him, and you see his, his uh, polls uh, dropping w by his standards precipitously. I know to the outside world, it looks like they're, they're uh, staying remarkably stable, but he's lost massive support uh, by, again, by the standards of our very divided electorate uh, because of his handling of the pandemic. Um, but, but, you know, he's, he's also, I think, um, inviting a conversation among people who had been inclined to just close ranks behind him about whether expertise matters, about whether global cooperation matters, about whether nationalism as construed as isolationism and this degree of inward nationalistic focus as to whether that can work and deliver uh, for the American people. So, my hope, I mean, echoing uh, what Prime Minister Rudd said, but, but my hope is not only that you see, yes, uh, of course, a new president, but also a rejection of those tenets of the Trump way, because Trump is just a symptom of a set of tenets that aren't just attractive here. They've also gotten more traction in countries like Hungary, Turkey, Russia, 
and you know where populists are ruling and when they are rejecting expertise in science and pitting one part of society against the other, uh, that is not actually going to benefit even those people who support the leader pursuing uh, that line of approach. And I think the pandemic has really exposed that and creates an opportunity for rethinking of these allegiances. Lynn, how about from you? How do Asian countries view the deterioration of US-China relations as affecting Asia and particularly Southeast Asia? Um, I think it's fair to say that Asian countries, including Southeast Asia, are viewing the worsening relations between the United States and China with considerable alarm. It, well, it clearly hurts um, prospects for growth for the region, but also um, what it does is it narrows the strategic choices that are available to countries in the region. Um, I think the United States has said repeatedly that it's not asking countries to choose sides. You know, whatever it is that they say, in a world that's increasingly decoupled, whether it's in terms of technology or in trade, um, Southeast Asian countries in particular are going to be finding it increasingly difficult not to make a choice. And this puts them in an impossible bind because what are they looking at? The United States provides the security umbrella for the region. And under that, uh, that umbrella, um, countries have been able to take shelter and become relatively prosperous. So they appreciate that. Um, China will not be able to step into that role very easily, even though its military is growing because of mistrust of China and various other factors. The US um, multinational corporations as well, they form the largest bulk of foreign direct investment in much of Asia. Um, and um, Although China is fast catching up with the United States, um, you know, the United States still has a lead role in that respect. Now, China, on the other hand, is the largest trading partner of many countries in Asia, um, including all of the United States allies. And it's been the largest trading partner of ASEAN as a whole for over a decade. And China also benefits from the fact that, or the perception that um, it has the wind behind its economic sales. So what are countries being asked to make a choice about? Put very bluntly, it's a choice between security and, pros uh, and, and prosperity. And most countries know that you can't have economic growth without security. And without security, um, economic growth will be very difficult. So I think if we look at how countries in Southeast Asia have been handling it. They've really tried to tiptoe around the uh, issue. And looking at the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which was issued last uh, summer, we see them try to do this balancing act between the United States and China. So while it adopts um, uh, Indo-Pacific terminology to reference the region. Um, it also talks about the importance of infrastructure development for the region. And it does not talk about, you know, the quadrilateral security dialogue, which incenses China and instead focuses on the importance of economic integration as well as connectivity. Um, it tries to reassert the centrality of ASEAN um, and importantly underscores uh, the importance of adhering to uh, a rules-based order. So this last bit is significant because I think in this um, tug of war between, between the United States and China, if Southeast Asian countries in particular have, are to have any hope of, you know, trying to, to um, maintain any degree of independence or um, uh, flexibility of uh, foreign policy options. I think how they would best approach um, this uh, rivalry is that they should be framing their choices in terms of a choice not between the United States and, the United, uh, and China, but a choice to uphold principles and the rule of law. And this may in some circumstances, uh, some circumstances mean offending China and other circumstances um, mean offending the United States. So this very precarious balance. Well, and it's fascinating to see how China's um, manipulating its image. Kevin Rudd, what do you make of that? How is China going at, at balancing its more aggressive so-called wolf warrior diplomacy with its more gentler, hard on its sleeve approach? Because we see it, don't we, at the moment, barking at critics, but it's also positioning itself as a bit of a global savior. It's dishing out medical equipment, supplies to the world, not to mention that multi-billion dollar aid package that Samantha um, mentioned a little bit earlier. Do you think this strategy is working out? 
let me say just a few short things about that so we can bounce the conversation around a little bit. Uh, look, we should never forget that China is driven by domestic politics. Um, and the, the reality is that China's um, communist regime has taken a huge hit in terms of domestic legitimacy as a consequence of the events of January and February of this year. Uh, and that is that uh, when the uh, Communist Party failed to manage the pandemic, and when we had a large number of infections and deaths within China itself, but more importantly, a huge hit on the economy and the fundamental social contract between the Communist Party and the Chinese people for the last 40 years, which is along these lines, you the people give us your political rights and we will ensure that you are economically prosperous. That contract has been um, partly torpedoed by the uh, scale of the economic damage which has been delivered uh, to uh, Chinese people. One little anecdote, there are no jobs for university graduates in China this year. So what are they doing? Everyone due to graduate a university in China this year, and from my recollection, that's probably about 10 to 12 million people, um, they've been told to do graduate school. Um, in fact, there are no options. That's just one minor insight in terms of what the employment market is doing in China. And with a, let's call it a less than even trajectory towards economic recovery. So uh, the reason I speak about this a little is that it's important for us not to assume that um, China is simply driven by international factors when it engages uh, in its uh, various forms of international behavior. Um, it's driven also by a deliberate, um, shall we say, exercise in domestic nationalism by the Chinese um, system uh, in order to revalidate the legitimacy of the system. And so that brings us into the second question, uh, which is, and what are they doing in the system uh, internationally? Um, and many of us will stretch our heads as professional diplomats. I used to be one, Samantha was one. Um, and uh, we've observed, why would China want to unleash wolf diplomats, Zhenlong, Wai Jiao, to go out there and um, frankly, do exactly the opposite of what Dale Carnegie's book told us to do 60 years ago, which is to win friends and influence people. I had this old fashioned view as a professional Australian diplomat back in the Mesolithic period when I first joined the Australian Foreign Service, that our job was to go and win friends and influence people. Uh, this is basically saying to any country which disagrees with Beijing, you're wrong uh, and you need to quote, correct your mistakes, unquote. So for those of us engaged in, let's call it rational diplomacy, this is passing strange, but it's not passing strange if it's all about a domestic political game aimed at enhancing the legitimacy uh, of uh, the system, which has taken a huge pounding. Uh, and final point is, if you look at China's objective behavior in the world and its objective standing, it now has a bucket load of problems uh, on, its, uh, on its hands, uh, not just a hit on the economy. Uh, how does that play into their ability to fund the Belt and Road? Uh, the uh, the uh, enduring and intensifying security policy tensions with its neighbours, particularly given its predisposition, playing that domestic nationalist card to push down on the India-China border, to push down on Hong Kong, to push down on the South China Sea with a further extension of Chinese uh, declared administrative zones in order to enhance its sovereignty claim, to push down on Taiwan and to push back against Japan and the East China Sea. So... There's an objective bucket of problems here, uh, but the, what we learn from this, I think, or I observe, is that the principal problem as perceived from Beijing is to re-entrench internal legitimacy of the system, given the huge hit uh, which they've taken as a consequence of COVID-19. I want to talk more of that bucket of problems that you've talked about there, Kevin Rudd. We've got a question from the audience. Do you think military power will and should be scaled down as a result of COVID-19? Is that to me or to Samantha? That's to you, Kevin. All right. If you're happy to pick it up. Smart. And Samantha's already talked about the, shall we say, the overplay of, let's call it, the military dimensions of um, international policy, looking at it from an American perspective. And certainly my own critiques of the Bush administration largely echo that. Talk about a squandering of the American unilateral moment at the end of last century. Um, Bush gets elected by half a hanging chad. And then we have um, uh, America's extraordinary accumulation of political capital, um, basically flushed down the S-Bend through this extraordinary adventurism in Iraq in pursuit of the elimination of weapons of mass destruction, which never existed. 
And the consequence of that um, has been uh, an America being embroiled in that part of the world for a long period of time. So Samantha didn't say this, but I'm kind of from the Teddy Roosevelt School of American Foreign Policy. Uh, walk quietly and carry a big stick, uh, which is um, uh, everyone knows that uh, America can act, but it should exercise its military power selectively, deeply selectively, uh, in order to ensure that the system uh, is performing. Um, as for the ability to uh, deal with the sorts of challenges which the pandemic has created, it goes back to our original discussion of a functioning global order. You can't take geopolitics out of the equation, uh, much uh, Lynn as our Southeast Asian friends would like to from time to time and kind of wish it away. It's just there. We just got to deal with it. Um, but secondly, on these clear areas of global governance dysfunction, which is pandemic management, it goes to the other arm of a functioning international system, which are the institutions of international governance. Um, and therefore, our job as responsible global citizens should be to do whatever we can to reinvest in and to re-empower the critical institutions of global governance, in this case, the World Health Organization, to act independently, not to be subject to political pressure, uh, and to have much more vigorous and intrusive inspectorate powers than they've had in the past. That, I think, lies in uh, what we need to do, rather than kind of wishing the military away. Because in an idealistic world, and even certainly in a realistic world, it ain't, it ain't gonna happen. Samantha, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, how this pandemic has been uh, handled. Obviously, as Kevin mentioned there, the WHO has copped a lot of flack for the way it's handled things. But how do we rally against misinformation and disinformation? Because um, we've seen the WHO also criticised for pandering to China, some world leaders have played out a severe and so we saw a lot of people turning to conspiracy theories, fake news about the virus. Who do we turn to to trust a trusted voice in a time of crisis? Um, well, let me let me take the the misinformation question, which I think is the heart of what you're asking, in just a second, and and just step back and and pick up on where Kevin left off on functioning, effective potentially strengthened international institutions. Uh, one of my favorite sayings about, about the UN, one of those international institutions um, that uh, in the case of the UN Security Council has been blocked on the pandemic, can't even declare the pandemic a threat to international peace and security, even though we were able to do so for Ebola, and this is so much more dire and has affected every country on the earth. And, uh, tens of millions of people. Um, so the UN Security Council not functioning, WHO you mentioned, but um, my favorite saying about, about the UN system comes from Richard Holbrook, the late American diplomat, who liked to say blaming the UN for a crisis is like blaming Madison Square Garden, you know, our, our uh, place where people play basketball in New York City, Madison no. Square Garden, when the New York Knicks play badly. That is, you're largely blaming a building. You can blame Madison Square Garden all you want. You can blame Wembley. You can blame whatever you, but, but ultimately it's the players and uh, as everyone knows, particularly the major players who are going to dictate the ultimate performance. So when it comes to looking back at the World Health Organization, you cannot divorce the World Health Organization's response from the fact that from day one of the Trump administration, the United States had been withdrawing from a whole variety of international bodies, actually not the WHO, but even though it wasn't doing a high profile tantrum as it would subsequently do on the WHO prior to the pandemic, it didn't fill its executive board seat. It wasn't even a relevant presence. So yes, the US, as Trump says, is the number one donor uh, to the World Health Organization. And that's incredibly important and should give it a ton of influence. We have, I think, uh, 17 US citizens who work embedded in the World Health Organization staff that was part of this alarm system and this coordinating body. But do you think that people back in Washington were paying much attention to what those 17 civil servants or public health professionals had to say about what they were learning from within the WHO? No, not at a political level, because again, the disposition was to be mistrustful, to feel that you know anything global is bad and that they're trying to rip us off and take our money. 
And I mention that because that's in terms of the US role in the WHO before and during the pandemic. China is very, very similar. Again, it's a major player on what should be a team. So you can blame the WHO and there's, and there's a lot to look back at, uh, particularly on the issue that Kevin raised, which is you know, the question of whether they could have pushed harder for access sooner and when denied access, whether they should have been more outspoken rather than taking the diplomatic, the traditional diplomats approach of being obsequious, uh, which does not stand up well uh, with time and in light of events. But, but China, who was going to stand up uh, to China? Who was gonna have the back of the WHO civil servants saying, you stick it to them. They're blocking access. They're not letting you go to Wuhan. They're not allowing you to dispatch your team to figure out what the heck is going on. They're telling you there's no human to human transmission. You know, instead of being credulous in that way, push and indeed push publicly if that's what you need to do for access. For that to happen, either the US was gonna be that voice pushing as it has been traditionally over the years, or again, back to Kevin's original point, the democracies or the, or the countries in the WHO uh, who believe in accountable governance, who were alarmed at what their health professionals were telling them, should have delivered that message in mass instead of waiting for the, the civil servants, uh, you know, the secretary general likes to say that he's more secretary than general. And you can view the international civil servants to some extent in a similar vein. So my point here is that as we think about what strengthening international institutions is going to look like, there's really no door number two that doesn't pass through major capitals um, or that doesn't require building a coalition at least a numerically influential coalition of middle powers or smaller countries. So you either have to have strength in numbers or you have to have the strong powers, uh, you know, not at, with, not at loggerheads or one of them, you know, really driving a reform agenda and isolating the other. And, and so I just think that's really important to bear in mind because it's very tempting to just see the bright shiny object and the logo of the UN agency, but it comes back, you know, again, unfortunately, to what Beijing and Washington are going in the, in the wake of this pandemic uh, to, to, to push the WHO to become. And I don't see current modern day, today's Washington or today's Beijing with any appetite to do the things that Kevin rightly said are needed for a strength in WHO. And so it's going to require much as the launching an investigation into the pandemic required other countries really isolating China the US and China may well be isolated on these questions of strengthened authorities and so be it. But it's going to require lots of uh, very energetic diplomacy to build that coalition such that that will get done given the disproportionate weight that the major donors have in these organizations. Let me just say a quick thing and, and um, sorry to not go right at your question, but on misinformation and, and actually take it a little bit away from international organizations to something that Australia, I think, is much further ahead uh, on than the United States, and that's social media platforms, where so many of these conspiracy theories are taking root. It's no accident mm -hmm. that the Wolf Warriors, uh, you know, are are uh, taking on more and more Twitter accounts and taking their cue from the Russian playbook from the 2016 election and what Russia has done in the U.S. democracy since. Uh, and China's using social media now, not, not all that effectively, still a bit more clumsily, I suspect, than they will uh, a year from now or five years from now. Uh, but they recognize that that's a place to sow division within democracies. That's a place to tell your own story. Uh, as, as Kevin said, that's a place to impress your Communist Party officials, uh, your, your fellow officials with your nationalism and your bona fides back in Beijing. That may be a uh, a major part of it. Um, but what, what has happened in Australia is you all have moved forward, as I understand it, in a, in a much more aggressive and energetic way when it comes to actually tracking what these social media platforms are allowing. Um, in the United States, there has been a very laissez-faire regulatory environment where uh, particularly as, a, and I'm taking this now beyond COVID, particularly as it relates to politicians and what they can get away with on the platform. Uh, basically, the view of these companies is we don't want to alienate uh, people who might regulate us. And so the way we don't alienate people who might regulate us 
is we let them say whatever they want, even if it is misinformation, even if it borders on incitement to violence, as some of President Trump's uh, tweets have, have uh, bordered on, if not crossed that line in recent weeks with our protests around Black Lives Matters. Why do I mention this? Because I actually think we are getting with COVID proof of concept that Facebook and other social media platforms can draw these lines because they are being much more aggressive on the life and death consequences uh, that, that stem from misinformation as it relates to this pandemic. And this is true of Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, all of the major companies, co companies than they have been on arguably uh, threats that were life and death beforehand and certainly threats to our democracy. Uh, given the damage uh, that falsehoods, peddling falsehoods and disinformation, um, the damage that that has done in, in widening and, and hardening divisions uh, within major democracies. So I actually think on, on misinformation, we may be getting the beginnings of proof of concept uh, that companies can go further. And I think that's why you, you see Mark Zuckerberg and others under much more sustained political pressure than he has faced in the entire history of Facebook uh, because he's proving in one domain that he is prepared to be aggressive, even as he sort of, uh, again, exempts uh, large, uh, you know, ter large parts of the terrain um, uh, claiming neutrality, which is, which is, I believe, a false claim. I, if I may, um, Janice, I just wanted to pick up mm. on points uh, made um, by uh, Kevin and Samantha. Um, mm. So Kevin talked about the objective difficulties that China is facing, um, in uh, the face of COVID. And Samantha also talked about how, you know, the wolf warriors and their attempts at uh, shaping the narrative might not be all that um, successful or, or, um, or effective. But I think from the region, um, perhaps not amongst the decision-making elites necessarily, but broadly, there is a degree of traction um, in terms of the, story, the narrative that China has done very well in tackling the, the COVID crisis and that you know, um, China is facing um, bullying from the West. And unfortunately, that, has had, that narrative has had a degree of stickiness. And uh, although I think in the case of COVID-19, you know, we're having loss of lives and livelihoods. So there really are no winners. But the question is not wh whether, you know, China is doing badly, it's who's doing worse. And I think in this respect, the image in around mid-March of, you know, China getting no new cases of COVID-19. And then on the other hand, in Europe and in America, thousands getting infected, you know, thousands dying. I mean, that was a stark image that stayed in the mind of many even before COVID, there were question marks over American leadership, um, its commitment to the region, its wherewithal. Post-COVID, with the handling of um, the United States handling of the, uh, the, the pandemic, how chaotic it was, um, you know, that, that kind of really um, re reinforced images in the region of the United States as a declining power. And it's not only about capacity. If we look at the political will to lead, how did the United States respond to COVID-19? Was it to kind of assert a global uh, leadership role, a, a responsible role? Unfortunately not. What it did was really to kind of issue all sense of regional or international responsibility, uh, leadership or even responsibility, because some of the actions that it was taking to um, try to bolster its own position in the fight against COVID directly undermined um, the interests of allies and partners like Germany when masks were diverted from Thailand you know, uh, to the United States. Um, so I think that while it may be true that objectively China is not doing well, um, and in some respects we regard their, their world diplomacy as kind of crude and ineffective, there is a larger buy-in by the region. Um, amongst the populace was, uh, in general, but also, I mean, I think it'll increasingly bleed into the decision and policy making elites as well. Not least because many in the region um, actually benefit from this narrative that authoritarian states do better in fighting the pandemic at least and crisis in general. Um, I'm just surprised at how often this is repeated even by intellectuals in the region that, you know, authoritarian states have an edge in dealing with crisis. Now, this is 
evidently false if we look at um, the examples of South Korea and Taiwan, but there are also counterexamples which have given people um, reason to believe this narrative. So we have Vietnam doing well, even though it has very little resources to uh, test for COVID-19. It has zero, it has had zero deaths despite a proximity to China. Um, Singapore um, also doing fairly well until you know it was hit by a second wave because of its work within the tightly packed dormitory. Um, but then if we look at dem democracies, um, electoral democracies in the region, Indonesia and the Philippines, these two countries have done exceedingly poorly. Indonesia chose to stick its head in the sand and avoid um, the situation altogether, saying it wasn't a problem. When it finally decided it was a problem, it took a week or more to act. You know, it cancelled large religious gatherings, but only after thousands had travelled uh, to attend these gatherings, leading to several infections. And then in the case of the, of the Philippines as well, you know, uh, measures were taken too little, too late. And so you have those two countries, which are democracy, uh, electoral democracy in Southeast Asia, actually faring the worst in Southeast Asia. So there, there are um, facts or factoids that you can throw up to give stickiness or traction to the false narrative that authoritarian uh, states fare better in dealing with crisis. Um, but, uh, but the focus of the region has largely been, it really does. And that, and that has given you know, authoritarian states in the region um, or even democracies in the region, um, the opportunity to pass, to take very um, um, militant measures um, against their own population, but also to entrench their powers uh, within the country. So we see that in the case of Cambodia and uh, the Philippines as well, just to give two examples. But I guess there, there is this concern, isn't there, that some authoritarian states are using things like the tracking and tracing and curbing people's liberties and freedoms, that they're using these things and not putting an end date on them, and that people are concerned that they might use these things to, to further strengthen their grip on power. Is that a legitimate concern? I think certainly it is a concern. If any, if you, if if the international community is worried about uh, um, reversals on democratic gains, and so we look at Cambodia, um, Pres uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen initially was remarkably unconcerned about COVID nineteen, and so he threatened to cut reporters that were masked in the briefings. Uh, he refused to uh, to ferry back. Um, Cambodians who were in Wuhan when the virus broke out. He decided to go visit uh, President Xi Jinping in uh, Beijing in February, uh, just to show that there was no problem. But he seems to have had a change of heart uh, since then, because uh, at, at around the end of April, I believe it was, he decided that you know the situation was obviously serious enough to pass emergency laws. Now, what did this emergency laws? Um, uh, what did this entail? Yes, um, handling uh, it allowed Cambodia allows Cambodia to respond in the case of national health emergencies, but also to uh, respond in far more vague cases, you know, where there there is national chaos, whatever that might mean, and also um, where the security of the nation is considered to be in serious jeopardy, again, not defined, then uh, martial law can um, be implemented. So there are certainly cases, worrying cases, of an authoritarian turn in the region. And I think this would be very unfortunate because I think as Samantha knows, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to get democracy entrenched, but far easier to have it reversed. And I think that's my concern for the region. Kevin, globalisation was slowing even before this pandemic. Do you think we've reached peak globalisation in terms of trade, investment and migration? Um, I think there have been um, two impediments to the progress of, let's call it, neoliberal uh, globalisation. Um, by neoliberal, I mean one which um, is capitalist in nature and with um, minimal social protections. Um, the one impediment which has been at work for quite a long period of time has been the failure of states and elites benefiting from globalisation to do much substantive in terms of domestic inequality. Uh, and as a consequence, um, I mean, people are not stupid. I mean, people in democracies um, around the world um, ask themselves a question, uh, am I better off or worse off? 
Um, and as if you have an inability to redistribute wealth more effectively in the um, Western democracies and or other democracies, uh, then as a consequence, uh, those um, constituencies are going to become much more amenable to the sort of um, populist nationalist identity politics based rhetoric, which Samantha referred to earlier, uh, which Trump has appealed to in the United States. So that's, if you like, if I was trying to be sort of uh, analytical about what is being the driving factor in politics, pushing back against the pulling down of boundaries, uh, which so many of us have welcomed over many decades, given where boundaries have taken us to in the past, which is usually conflict, autarky and war, um, unless we, uh, the democracies, uh, Western or other, and other states deal with the inequality agendas within our own country, then we're not actually dealing with the primary causative factors. Then you've got the second contributing factor to let's call it uh, peak globalization, um, which uh, probably uh, reached its peak in around about a year 2016, possibly in November of that year, but I'm, I'm just not wishing to be too precise about it. But when you then had the quote leader of the free world, um, basically then legitimizing through the bully pulpit of American, not just domestic politics, but global political leadership, that the essential nostrums uh, of uh, nationalism and protectionism were valid and were morally defensible. Uh, and in fact, formed the absolute pillars of his make America great again strategy. And then of course, the other feeder systems around the world, whether it's in Bolsonaro's Brazil, or uh, Erdogan's Turkey or, or wherever, um, countries which have um, at various times been part of the democratic uh, family of nations saying, well, that's what the leader of the free world is saying. Um, and if you were to do a simple academic exercise and track the extent to, words, to which words like nationalism and protectionism have now become part of the acceptable domestic international vocabulary over the last three to four years, then when American leadership goes bad, as it has done on these questions, it has a multiplying effect. So in summary, there's a driving factor, which we're all responsible for, which is inequality within our countries, our communities, and our economies. And we need to tend to our own social contracts uh, in order to obtain the political constituency support to sustain uh, what I would describe as a social democratic form of uh, globalization. Uh, but secondly, absent, um, let's call it, the uh, intellectual leadership and the sheer capacity of the United States underpinning the institutions of global governance, pushing in that right progressive direction, then it's going to go backwards at a pace of knots, which is what's happened uh, over the last uh, three to four years. Samantha, a lot of our audience is very interested in the future of multilateralism. Uh, the pandemic, of course, putting a squeeze on multilateral institutions. Can multilateralism survive this? Well, if I may, you know, I'm sorry I keep doing this, but to pick up on, because I think Kevin's point was, mm. was such an important uh, sort of precursor to the question about multilateralism, because mm. what you're seeing now uh, in, in a lot of places, but certainly in the United States, is a, is a temptation to throw baby out with bathwater for, for the very reasons that Kevin has put his finger on. Uh, there is a disillusionment with the downsides of economic globalization. The, the, the people who have been left behind, who feel as if they were seen through, seen past. I mean, I want, just for, to, to accentuate this point, Recall that 9% of the voters who voted for Barack Obama in 2012 shifted to Trump in 2016. And this was an election that was settled by 78,000 votes spread across three states. So we're talking about millions of votes uh, in, hanging in the balance. 7% of the people who voted for Obama in 2012 stayed home in 2016. So you're talking about many millions of votes in play uh, for a very, very narrow margin. And that margin then produced the second part of Kevin's prior response in terms of the embrace of nationalism, xenophobia, uh, protectionism, um, and, and the legitimation, and then the contagion really around those concepts. Um, so, so after 
this sort of contingent outcome, but you know, Donald Trump uh, is the president and has had the effects that he's had over this three and a half years. Um, uh, there is a lot of buyer's remorse in, in, in the United States in both political parties around the exuberance around free trade, around the ways in which um, often sort of perceived corporate interests uh, took the place of or was seen as stand-ins for workers' interests or citizens' interests. And, you know, this um, reckoning or this backlash began really in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, but Trump really sort of, and, and that's something that because of the disillusionment with the financial crisis, it's, it's one of the reasons that Barack Obama as an insurgent, as a newcomer was able, as a non-representation of the old way of doing things was able to sweep into office. Uh, but Trump has, has ridden that wave and, and he's expanded it because as uh, again, using the pulpit, not only domestically, but all around the world to press this message that globalization is bad for your people uh, and, that it's, and that foreigners are dangerous and that the world is a zero sum place where if someone else is gaining, you are losing. That, that, you know, Trump was elected for a whole bunch of reasons, but he's now had and will have had four years to, to again, uh, deepen um, the, 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 the spread and, and, and spread that, that message. Uh, the, the, the unfortunate, the, the good part of, of what has come out of that is I think there is far more attention uh, in, in circles that we're, we're really looking past these issues to issues of economic inequality. I mean, and the pandemic is, is uh, accelerating that as well. I mean, a, a very different uh, balance between the state and the market, a very different conception in the United States as to what the cushion should look like for people who fall behind. And of course, our protests uh, around racial injustice are only um, you know, extending that conversation appropriately into more and more domains. So there's been a major shift and a healthy shift there's also been a healthy shift in thinking about how American engagement in the world gets better sold to a skeptical domestic audience that has been listening to Trump for four years or that has suffered this, what they perceive to be the economic consequences of globalization. So you'll see people who believe in an engage or an internationalist America much more attentive to selling a foreign policy for the middle class. So that's the good news, that there's some really, I think, healthy correctives to some of what we in the Obama administration and others got wrong. But the bad news is there's a temptation to throw political globalization out with uh, the economic globalization. And so the backlash is not only, uh, again, along the dimensions that Kevin has described, but it's going to require a lot of work to convince Americans, and I realize I'm talking very much as an American here in this response, but to convince them to invest in those political structures that you meant in your question when you talked about effective multilateralism. So, so in other words, to distinguish, okay, there were people who were left behind in economic globalization. How do we correct? What is the right balance between the state and the market? What is the right set of environmental and labor protections in our uh, trade treaties that won't leave so many Americans behind? How do we alter our supply chain so we're more resilient. That conversation is happening and it's rich and it's interesting. And Joe Biden's own platform, I think, has shifted in a very progressive direction just in recent months. But the conversation about what our investment in political institutions looks like is more sclerotic. And I think the most encouraging thing that has come uh, out of Joe Biden is, is, again, along the lines of what Kevin was saying in his first response, which is, one of the first things he's going to do if he becomes president is convene a summit of democracies. On the agenda will be things like how do we together combat misinformation? How do we protect our election systems? How do we combat climate change? Um, but it's also going to be like be about what does effective multilateralism look like? And it doesn't look like a China, uh, a Chinese influenced or Chinese dictated rules based order, because the rules that China has an interest in seeing are ones that would mean less intrusion on what goes on inside states, less human rights protections, less independent monitoring, less transparency. And those are the kinds of uh, efforts that China is making now uh, with the US very much on the sidelines. Uh, but it does, it would have to, in order to be effective multilateralism, entail middle powers, democracies, who perhaps for too long have been sitting back 
willing to be part of US-led coalitions, but not themselves taking initiative hmm. uh, on very many issues. And I think for there to be effective multilateralism, coalitions of democracies are gonna to have to be much more coordinated, uh, much more strategic and savvy, because China, as, as has been said, is using the leverage of its economic heft in the developing world to bring even those who are actually not that impressed with their pandemic response, African leaders condemning uh, the treatment of Africans inside China, people frustrated that the PPE comes with a requirement that you have to praise China or vote with China within the UN. There's not a lot, a lot of soft power being won outside the region. I, I can't speak for, for, uh, for the region itself, but, but for effective multilateralism to occur when you have so many fence sitters trying to decide Am I gonna go in the direction of what China wants to see in terms of multilateralism, or am I gonna to try to retain transparency and accountability, use my, my, uh, my vote and my, my status as a, as a country within a coalition to get multilateralism invested uh, in peace and security, in human rights, in economic development. Uh, all those fence sitters are, are waiting to see, again, where the United States goes, but also where democracies like Australia uh, plan to go and whether they plan to take initiatives um, of the kind that I think we've just been seeing in recent months. We do have quite a bit of interest from our audience on the issue of climate change. I know this is changing tack quite a bit, but I do want to put this to you because um, there has been a bit of interest about this. Kevin, you've been a long time passionate advocate for stronger global action on that front on climate change. Uh, what do you think about that? Is it possible to get climate change back on the global agenda? Uh, what we sought to do a decade ago, um, around about the time of the Copenhagen conference, was exercise Australian international leadership. Very unpopular at the time, <laughs> um, not least of which um, domestically and to some extent internationally. But frankly, um, uh, some of us had a look around the room and found that um, not a lot was happening. Um, and so uh, we began organizing coalitions of the, quote, policy willing. Uh, what subsequently became known as the Cartagena Group of uh, like-minded countries. Um, uh, that is, those supporting a uh, substantive climate change outcome uh, in Copenhagen and then later at Paris. Uh, we formed um, and uh, we got running together with uh, the British and then we got uh, the Ethiopians and then we got... And by the time we got to conference time, we actually had a significant uh, gaggle of support. Uh, what happened at the Copenhagen Conference on climate change a decade ago uh, was that uh, China decided to roadblock it and got India to help it. Um, that's the bottom line. Um, but let me tell you, the international activism we used uh, made it harder and harder at that stage for China to continue to say no and their post-Copenhagen learnings on uh, international climate change diplomacy is really insightful because the Chinese concluded they had taken a big international diplomatic hit uh, against them um, by being the obstructionists they were on that occasion. And the, ch and the sea change in Chinese policy settings on international agreements on climate change action between 2010 and 2015 in Paris is huge. So therefore, um, climate change is no respecter of persons, no respecter of um, national boundaries, uh, no respecter of, uh, respecter of ethnicity. And you know something in my own dealings with the Chinese um, leadership on these questions and Chinese uh, think tanks and minist ministers responsible even in recent months is they actually get this, uh, that this is fundamentally in their national interest. And to go back to another uh, excellent point made by Samantha before, the challenge for all of us globally, given this um, peak globalization phenomenon you mentioned, given the uh, popularity that populists have found through smashing the United Nations system, almost as a reflex re a reaction in domestic politics. Look at Abbott in this country um, uh, in the past. Uh, look at Morrison's speech uh, against globalism only a few months ago in Australia is to be able to sell an effective political message domestically that international cooperation is in the national interest and in your personal interest, and that there's no alternative. Unless we have international cooperation on trade, guess what? Australia's living standards will collapse by between 20 and 
if we go into a mercantilist world in the future. And you need international rules for that. On climate, um, if one half of this country, Australia, becomes uninhabitable and the North China Plain ceases to produce agriculture effectively uh, for to feed China's 1.4 billion people, guess what? It doesn't matter what Australia and China do domestically unless the world is acting simultaneously, given the problem of Indian emissions, not to mention the United States having stepped out for lunch for the last four years. Um, the bottom line is, um, unless we're all in this together, it doesn't happen. So my point is to make uh, a, uh, uh, an argument in defense of Samantha's proposition about how we sustain global cooperation, which the technical term is multilateralism, but that is a real turnoff for voters in any country, global cooperation to solve national problems. And on climate, I think it um, under a Biden administration and with the Chinese continued national interest in acting uh, in order to bring down global greenhouse gas emissions. Hopefully it becomes the vehicle, notwithstanding all the geopolitical tensions, which will continue between the United States and China in the future uh, over any manner of issues, that on the question uh, of climate change, there is sufficient recognition of combined national interest to sustain this space. And in fact, to demonstrate that we can act effectively uh, to preserve the global columns. Final point, global commons. Final point, is action up until now sufficient? Well, of course not. I mean, I'm not being Pollyanna-ish about this. If everybody honoured their Paris commitments, we will have achieved one third of the greenhouse gas reductions necessary to keep temperature increases under two degrees centigrade by century's end. That's if everybody honours their Paris commitments. Um, so given that backsliding on that, and we've got two thirds still to go, uh, then um, if you're Roman Catholic, you'd be pulling out, as, as we are, you'd be pulling out your rosary beads and seeing what can be done. But given that we believe in real policy action and what states can do and what technology can do to help us on the way through with appropriate political leadership, we can get there. We can really get there. And the message of progressive politics to the world at large is that, frankly, it ain't all that hard. This is perfectly doable to keep temperature increases within two degrees. Uh, yes, I know it requires political will, but political will, political cooperation with a, with a technology fix on the way through, um, put those three things together, uh, you're seriously, um, you're seriously um, pumping iron. Thanks so much. Kevin, Lynn, I wanna bring you back in here. We heard Kevin there talking about the need for global cooperation. And we have a, a question from the audience. Do you think the world can enter a multipolar order without the direction of the US or China? Or do you think the wider retreats from globalization uh, with those retreats that this might be the end of international cooperation as we know it? Quite doom and gloom. Well, I think given the economic and military strategic diplomatic heft of both the United States as well as China, I think it'll be very difficult to see uh, cooperation or good outcomes on any number of important issues without them. Whether we're looking at climate change, as we, have, we just spoke about, or the need to manage uh, nuclear proliferation and arms, uh, or handling this pandemic, we're definitely going to be needing the two major powers or the two superpowers, in fact, uh, to, to, to jump into the fray and actually get the hands dirty. But in some instances, some of the multilateral uh, institutions that we've been working off um, are in need of reform, but the response must surely to, to get your hands dirty and try to reform these institutions like the WHO rather than to kind of sideline them or undermine them altogether. So I think, um, you know, countries are worried um, about uh, the United States and China um, and their lack of cooperation and how this undermines the multilateral project or the global, uh, the project for global cooperation um, and um, are trying to get, uh, get around it through various means like the increased focus on regional cooperation, et cetera. But there really is no alternative uh, to many of the major uh, problems that the world faces without the two superpowers. 
Thank you so much, Lynn. I suppose we've heard from all of you uh, about some of the big challenges out there, but I'd love to finish on a positive note if we can. Is there any good news to come out of this? Lynn, we might kick off with you. Thanks so much. Um, I think with all this doom and gloom around us right now, I would be quite hard pressed to think about positive developments emerging from this. On the other hand, I think if we are to emerge from uh, this situation, both in terms of um, addressing the pandemic or quashing the pandemic, as well as the economic and social recovery that needs to take place after that, we need to see several things happening. So these might emerge if we emerge from the pandemic um, relatively unscathed. And I think one has been alluded to earlier, that's the need uh, for enlightened leadership. We need more leadership um, from um, the major powers, but uh, from, the, from the United States and China, but also from the middle powers who might have to step in to um, support um, the international community as the United States becomes more distracted and, um, and, uh, and faces divisions at home. Uh, the other thing I hope we, um, I hope we come away uh, from this pandemic with is a greater sense of connect, uh, connect, connectedness. Um, I have no problems with America first, China first, Russia first. I think all countries actually, for better or worse, seek to put their own nations first, their own citizen, citizens first. That's not the problem. The problem is the very narrow conception um, that leaders around the world have adopted um, with increasing support from their citizens. Um, and I think that's a bit ironic because nothing undermines the nation or the national project more than uh, an insular limited view of what what will work best in, in national interests. And unfortunately, we've seen far too many countries adopt this very narrow view of national interests instead of the focus on multilateralism and international cooperation. Um, the third thing I would like to see coming out of this, or that might come out of this, is more robust multilateral institutions. These are going to be what drives us out of a very bad, the very bad situation that we now find ourselves in. So if they are to work, we need to simultaneously seek to reform them. And as I mentioned earlier, the United States and China needs to be integral to these efforts. And finally, I think um, we need to have a, a greater appreciation of the threats that non-traditional security uh, challenges also pose to uh, the international community. And these um, extend from, you know, uh, things, like, and this might lead to a greater um, focus on healthcare, um, which I think that would be a good outcome if we focus more on healthcare and health systems and securing critical health uh, supply chains. Um, President Xi Jinping has already talked up uh, the, the need to develop a health silk road, while other countries, middle powers, the United States as well, also, um, you know, focus quite rightly on the, um, on the need for greater health development in many of the countries in, in Asia. And also, um, we talked about climate change earlier, you know, you know, one view and the preponderant view, unfortunately, is that climate change uh, priorities will take a step back, given the need to boost the world economy. But I think if we have a greater appreciation of the threats that non-traditional security challenges pose, we would also, in the efforts to rebuild economies and rebuild livelihoods, also factor into account the need for greater uh, climate sustainability. Thank you so much, Lynn, Samantha Power. I'd love to bring you back in here. Do you have anything positive to end on? Always, um, absolutely always. The, the great uh, Israeli psychologist, Amos Tversky said, uh, never be a pessimist because if you're a pessimist, you suffer twice. <laughs> uh, so it's one of the more pessimistic things one can say, uh, but <laughs> I'd, I'd offer, I'd offer uh, three really shining bright spots. And the first is uh, a little bit close to home there, uh, Taiwan. Taiwan, at the, the multidimensional ways in which they have tackled the coronavirus, the way they have um, also managed to export millions of masks to countries in need, including in the developing world. The trailblazing way in which they have integrated at the central level government ministers, social media, people who work for Facebook and the social media companies, and critically, 
civil society and, and citizen uh, activists, netizens in the corona response so that you can look on your phone uh, in Taiwan and if you're in need of masks, if you run out of masks, you can see at your nearest pharmacy what their mask supply is. And if it's going low, you know to go someplace else. Um, you, uh, when, you're traffic, when people are trafficking in misinformation, uh, citizens are the ones to raise the flare about that. It goes into a central process and there's an amazing amount of literacy when it comes to misinformation among Taiwanese internet users and so forth. I could go on, but it's, it's a model. And I think Taiwan, uh, despite being shut out of the World Health Organization, even as an observer by, by China, has really shown the world uh, a lot of what its democracy has to offer well beyond COVID. So that's one bright spot. Second bright spot, briefly, female leadership. And I don't think we even have to get into causality versus correlation. I think there's, there's for two reasons. One, if you think about what it takes to become a head of state for anyone, as, as Kevin Rudd knows, he's the only one of us who knows, uh, it's really hard. If you think about what it takes to become a female head of state, Good Lord, the, the, the qualities that these women have to get where they've gotten prepare them by and large for a crisis like that. It's not, it's not inevitable that they would handle it well, but some combination of toughness, humanity, uh, and of course, respect for science um, and, a, a, and a recognition of the importance of trust. I think that unites their responses. So, so they get where they get and, and they have shone. The second dimension of female leadership that's so important is irrespective of whether it's correlative or causal, that they're handling it better in Germany, Taiwan, Iceland, Finland, Norway, New Zealand. Those are countries led by women who've all done remarkably well in handling the pandemic. But irrespective, the kids in those countries who are seeing these women lead in this way, lead calmly, humanely, rigorously, those kids, perceptions of the future, of the present, of what's possible are altered by this experience. I mean, for so many countries, this is, these, these women are playing the role that Winston Churchill may have played in the, in the Second World War. This is such a crisis. It is so essential that leadership be as strong as some of these uh, leaders have shown it to be. But think of what boys and girls, their sense of the possible and how that has been altered by the fact that these are the women who fared well uh, in this crisis. And then the last thing briefly, uh, Kevin mentioned how uh, in the context of climate change, the climate change doesn't respect borders or ideology, or um, he didn't mention tweets, uh, but, but the pandemic is the same. And what we've seen in the United States, you can bluff your way through a pandemic, through faints and scapegoating of WHO or you know, bringing it back to China uh, again and again, as President Trump has done. But at a certain point, when it is seniors who are paying the price uh, primarily around the country uh, for the pandemic getting out of, whole, uh, out of control, for the mishandling of the pandemic, uh, when, when you when are uh, a churchgoer and you're not able to attend services because the pandemic has gotten so out of hand in your community, you know, you, you, you can divert all you want, but people are hungering in the United States, at least right now, and a lot can change between now and November, for evidence-based leadership, for truth-telling, for trusted leadership. And there's not a lot of evidence that the diversions and the scapegoating is working. Uh, politically. And so this is too partisan a thing to say, but I would say my third and final bright spot is Trump's falling uh, poll numbers. <laughs> Kevin Rudd, over to you. Any bright spots? Well, given that we've now gone two minutes over, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll a lot of time, I'm going to give you three points in 60 seconds. Uh, number one, uh, a Biden administration has every capacity to turn uh, these global challenges around. Um, the sort of foreign policy, international policy team and international economic team, which Biden is likely to pull together uh, is first class. Um, and therefore you're going to have such an appetite on the part of American allies and friends around the world uh, to work with uh, that globally progressive agenda 
that I think uh, it is potentially a very exciting four years ahead. I've seen all the criticisms of Joe Biden. I've met the guy when he's vice president. I know him reasonably, bit, uh, reasonably well. Um, sure, he's, um, he's not um, JFK. None of us are. Um, but guess what? Um, uh, he stands for decent values. But more importantly, the team will be good, first class. And there is a yearning on the part of democracies to make this work. Number two, just to build on uh, Samantha's earlier point, working collaboratively and collectively uh, to wrestle these global challenges, including climate to the ground. And finally, um, uh, I agree also with um, Samantha's point in terms of the positives about the uh, achievements of, um, of female leadership. Um, here in our part of the world, uh, Samantha, uh, the, um, the impact which uh, Jacinda Ardern and New Zealand has had on the way in which Australians think about these questions has been really impressive. And not just on COVID-19, but prior to that in the handling of the mass atrocities against Muslims within New Zealand as well. And to be frank, when the history of the COVID crisis is written, it was her early decision to take on uh, a national objective of eliminating the virus, number two, um, shutting the borders, and three, domestic lockdown, all very early, which frankly stampeded the male leadership of Australia into the same direction. I mean, that's the untidy, uncomfortable history of what actually happened down here. Um, so uh, when people talk about you know, Australia and New Zealand having done well, I think if we look at the sequencing of the decision-making process, there was genuine leadership by her on this. And I think that's had a huge effect on seeing democratically elected leaders um, who are women um, exercising such effective national leadership and what in at a time which frankly on a degree of difficulty if we're at the next Olympic Games this is 9.5 on the uh, on the diving scale of difficulty uh, with twist and pike and folks like this have pulled it off so well done to Jacinda Ardern. Well thank you so much Kevin Rudd. Uh, it was such a pleasure to hear from, from all of you. So thank you to Ambassador Power, Kevin Rudd and Lynn Kwok for sharing your sage wisdom and deep insights with us today. And on behalf of the ANU, we're really truly grateful for your engaging and thoughtful insights. So on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure.